My guest today is Tim Faulkner, and I'm very excited to talk to you, Tim, because uh, I know you are the co-director at Australian Reptile Park, which is one of my favourite tourist destinations. You are the general manager at Aussie Ark, which is a, a fantastic initiative and started out as Devil's Ark and became Aussie Ark. Uh, and that's amazing. I know you're a gifted communicator. Uh, you're also a very skilled educator and you're a regular TV presenter. You've created this series of videos for kids and young at heart called Animal Tales, which I've had a look at one and it's it's very captivating uh i wish you were around when my kids were small but tim welcome yeah welcome thank you very much for having me you probably were around when my kids were small but we won't talk about ages here <laughs> hey speaking of kids i know a lot of kids want to have, keep a snake as a pet or some other exotic yeah. animal were you one of those kids oh absolutely um you know before that i, I grew up in western sydney um, so, you, you know, you wouldn't exactly call it the adventure capital of the world. Um, but my, my parents, you know, my mum's side of the family is from the Blue Mountains and uh, were very much into um, botany. And, you know, I learned all my plants of banksias and wattles and flannel flowers. And my, my dad's family was out from Western New South Wales and they were actually um, kangaroo and rabbit pelters. And but what that gave my mum and dad, I think, was a great interest in the bush. And so I, I, I really credit my, um, my life's work with native wildlife to my experience as a kid in the bush. I spent a, an incredible amount of time on the, the, the mid-north coast up around Southwest Rocks and Coffs mm. Harbour. And I spent a, a lot of time out, down around the Murrumbidgee near Yass um, and a lot of time travelling throughout Australia. And I think as a kid, you don't know what's happening, but you're setting baselines. You know, the things you see and they change over time. And, you know, for example where we used to camp down at Yass and, you know, when we dug a hole in the ground and put an old tin dunny on it, that was revolutionary. That place is now subdivided into three hectare blocks and there's a thousand people, but things mm. change. And so my, my time in the bush as a kid, yeah. before I got into wanting to keep reptiles and things like that, um, really cemented it. But yeah, 10 years old, I had snakes and lizards and frogs and, um, you know, I had a, I had a, a, a real thing for the Australian bush and its animals. Mm, mm. Let's. You mentioned the uh, Murrumbidgee and Yass and how things have changed over time. What is going on in Australia? What is the importance of things like the Australian Reptile Park and and Aussie Ark and how have things changed and where are things going? Yeah, well, I mentioned about those the, the baselines, and you know, let's just go through that a baseline is something that you set you know you go to the park today and there's a slippery dip and a swing and a, 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 a you know a, a rocking horse and you go there a year later and they're not there it changed and so by creating those 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 baselines as a young fella I mean what's happening in Australia um it's 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 terrible we're a really developed country but just January gone, we were listed amongst the, we're the only developed nation on earth to list amongst the top 20 for loss of biodiversity, um, also land clearing. And <clears throat> let's, biodiversity, these words, they're actually really simple. Biodiversity is the number of living organisms in any one area. And if you just go back, let's say 200 years to, to, to European colonization of Australia, we've lost an incredible amount of biodiversity, the living things in one place. And when you come to our mammals, marsupials, we've got the world's worst extinction rate. We've lost nearly 40 small mammals to extinction in the last 200 years. That's as many as the rest of the world put together. Wow. It's big. Now, the problems, you know, why is that? And Australia is a really big place, right? And it's rugged and it's remote. <clears throat> but people make the mistake of thinking it's also pristine and intact. I have been to the furthest reaches of Australia in any capacity you can imagine. Nowhere is pristine. Feral pests have invaded our continent. Mm -hmm. And sure... As I mentioned earlier, we've got habitat destruction, urban sprawl, climate change, pollution, you name it, we got it, like the rest of the world. But we have a very unique problem. And 
That is, Australia has been separate from the rest of the world. Let's call it for all of history. And that isolation means we've been an island. We haven't had connectivity with all the other continents. So, first of all, I'll give you an example. A Tasmanian devil's skull is about twice the size of a fox. The fox's brain is three times larger than the devil's. So what happened is that our marsupials really lack intelligence compared to placental mammals. Placental mammals being live bearers, humans, primates, dogs, cats, bears, foxes, rodents. We didn't have them in Australia. You know, 50,000 years ago, we had marsupial lions, we had diprotodons, which are wombats the size of rhinoceroses. But today we have you know, monotremes, platypus and echidnas. We've got these wacky marsupials. We've got more reptiles than any other country on earth. Um, and that's because Australia is harsh. Reptiles have a much lower metabolic rate. They do well in harsh environments. Mammals, not so well, because you've got to eat too much too often to keep yourself warm. But so it's, it's fair to say, um, well, it's not fair to say, but people say, so, are the, so our animals are dumb. Kind of. I, I prefer to channel that into they're naive. If you want to go a little bit further, Australian animals evolved in an idealistic paradise mm -hmm. where drivers for evolution were uniqueness, like a duck-billed, venomous, egg-laying platypus. Um, so we, we had drivers for uniqueness. Now, what's really interesting is if you go up to northern Australia or New Guinea, pick up a rock and throw it across the pond over towards Indonesia, when that rock hits the ground, hypothetically, of course, you land in Indonesia, Borneo, Philippines. When the rock hits the ground, it finds primates, feral fox, cat, dog, rodents. So those species, even in, in Asia, have had overlapping connectivity all the way to Africa and the Americas, all, all the way. And so the drivers over there have been intelligence. You know, hypothetically, a fox from France over time can swap information over millennia with the fox in England. But Australia has never had that. So we've had this isolated island. What that has meant is that when Europeans came to Australia and we brought hoof stock, like goats and sheep, cows, horse, yep. Australia didn't have any of them. We brought feral pests like rodents, cats, fox. Now, of our mammal extinctions that I mentioned, over 90% of them are directly related to the feral fox and feral cat. Wow. They are a major, major issue. And so we are on the cusp of just a, a, a phenomenal extinction event. Um, mm. I'll, I'll pause there for a second. Mm. Yeah, it's ironic, isn't it, that with our isolation, I would have thought that we'd be in a pretty good place. But as you say, part of that is founded on uniqueness and then when these other things were introduced that were unique at that time yeah uh, they've taken over they've, so they've taken over and mm. and but, yeah this brings us to the vision of aussie arc which yeah. is tell us yeah well look because of that and I, and i guess coming into it as well is that um you know i'm by no means a climate skeptic in any capacity um the, things are changing there's no doubt about it the, the, the problem with it is that, that I have is that if I ask 10 different people, experts about climate change, I get 10 different answers. And that's confusing because I, I think the messaging around climate change um, and the communication is quite poor. We all know something's going on, but you, you know, turn the news on, you can hear 10. And so, but what's happened is it's become such a beast that it's almost left biodiversity as a, a bit of a, 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 a wake left in the back that, we're addressing these big things of, you know, carbon into the atmosphere. But at the end of the day, we're losing our animals and yeah, we're not right. paying attention to it. And yeah. most Australians are, in fact, naive to it. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. We, we know a lot more about giant pandas, giraffes and rhinos than we do northern hairy nose wombats, bilbies and numbats. Mm. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and it's very sad. And so... Guilty as charged. 
Yeah, and when mm. you when when you look at biodiversity, I mean, I, I give you the example like this. You go to one of our best national parks. Um, let's pick an iconic one, right? We'll say our biggest, Kakadu. It's overrun with ferals, feral donkeys, feral horses, feral pigs, feral buffalo, feral cats, feral fox. And it's becoming an ecological ghost town so far as our natives go. Um, you know, the mammals tend to disappear first. And then once the fox and cat have eaten the mammals, they turn to the reptiles and amphibians and the birds they can catch and it's in collapse. Mm. But you go to the Barringtons where, where, where I um, work and operate, wonderful place, 150,000 hectares in size. But it's a ghost town. And the most common species you will see are rabbit, hare, fox, rat, pig, um, and so on. And so realistically, there's very little attention being paid to that. Mm -hmm. And that's my area of expertise. I, I, I don't understand what's happening to the world in a big sense in, in climate change, let's mm -hmm. say. I, I mean, you know, agriculture, just especially out Western New South Wales, just clearing for monocropping and it's moonscape. But I don't know all this stuff. What I know is where I used to go as a kid is not what it was like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the natives are going. And so Australia is on a trajectory to have empty forests. Mm -hmm. Trees might look pretty. The air might even be clean. But the, the animals that make it Australia, um, we, we, we are losing them. And even now, I've, I've steered away from this, but even if you come to your big iconics like koalas, just consider this for a second. Like, really consider it. Koalas are on a trajectory, downward spiral. If they continue on the current trajectory, mm -hmm. they will be extinct in the wild in New South Wales by 2050. Now, I'm not making that up. Clever people aren't making it up. It's pretty easy to look at a trajectory. Mm. And there's a, a, a line, follow it down, it equals 2050. Mm. And I used that word before, we're naive to this. And again, I don't mean that disrespectfully. My, my, my own mum's naive to it, you know, and I love her more than anyone on earth. So, but what happens is as well, our animals aren't as cute or as, uh, as striking or captivating as a zebra or giraffe or rhino or orangutan or elephant or, or whales. And I'm sure everyone's heard of those species I just mentioned. I mean, and I, I just give you some numbers. I, I think there's around a, and, and I, look, I could be slightly off on these, doesn't matter, they're, they're close enough to write. Um, there's over 100,000 humpback whales. Um, there's around 100,000 orangutans or left in the wild. There's around half a million elephants. But even as Australians, we're marketed these species to support. Come to Australia, I could give you a list of 100. For example, there are 20 orange-bellied parrots. These are all Australian species. Mm -hmm. There are 20-odd orange-bellied parrots left in the wild. There's 70 northern hairy-nosed wombats. There's less than 1,000 Gilbert's potteroos, bilbies, numbats, and I could go on and on and on. Mm. And I'm sure that most of the people listening to this now won't have even heard of those species. Mm. And that's my job. That's okay. You know, yeah. you're hearing about them now. Yeah. So the Aussie Ark vision started with Tasmanian devils. And we've got this wonderful organization, the Australian Reptile Park. Um, the Reptile Park is the wildlife tourism facility. It's a profitable organization, but it's been directed and managed by John and Robin Weigel since the 1970s. Um, the Reptile Park is the sole facilitator in Australia of venom for the production of any venom. Um, since the 70s, we've saved around 20,000 lives and continue to do so this day. Um, John and Robin have a wonderful facility um, that I'm lucky enough to be co-owner and co-director of now, where our, our sole passion is to, we're, we're for young families. Um, you know, those that, I mean, people say, oh, wild animals shouldn't be kept in zoos. I, I understand that, I hear what they're saying, but most kids from Sydney, they ain't going to the Great Plains of Africa they ain't going to Komodo Islands to see Komodo dragons, and many of them, the experience they have at a wildlife organisation, it's the first time they see a real animal outside of a book or screen. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, the wonderful Mr Attenborough's got a line that how can you, people won't care about what they don't understand. And if these kids are never seeing an interface with animals beyond a book, how do we expect them to want to care for it? 
So John and Robin have also always engaged in um, either research or conservation. And the Tassie Devil, we really sunk our teeth into because I've mentioned a bunch of the problems facing Australia, but we sunk our teeth into it because the devil isn't suffering from feral pest invasion. Mm. It can deal with the fox and cat. And in fact, as the devil numbers have significantly declined in Tasmania because of the disease that I'll, I'll get to in a minute, cat numbers have gone through the roof. So it's really easy to retrospectively assess mm. devils were controlling cats. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we sunk our teeth into devils because they weren't suffering from the typical things of the habitat in Tassie is just fine. They're not suffering from feral pests. And so as a species, we really sunk our teeth in because by saving the devil, you're saving so much more. Uh, not only is it the closest living relative to the Tasmanian tiger that we sent to extinction, hmm. um, not only is it intrinsically valuable to save, but you save the devil, you save an, ecos an ecosystem provider. You know, where you have the devil, you have less cats. Where you have the devil, you have more natives that thrive. And so by right. saving the devil, you're actually saving an entire ecosystem. And so, mate, we sunk our teeth right into the devil. Yeah, that's helpful. To, yeah. And the, um, the, for, for anyone that, that doesn't know, um, in 1996, devils were found to have a disease. Mm. DFTD, devil facial tumour disease, mm. spreading like wildfire through Tassie. It's an aggressive facial cancer, um, very unique. There are, there are very few contagious cancers on earth. Mm. And, and that what was happens, completely, completely <coughs> independent of, of human. Oh, correct. Yeah, completely. And, you know, people were that uh, it, it developed as cancer because of a hole in the ozone layer or toxins. And look, someone might be right. Um, however, <clears throat> Australia is just one big island. Tasmania is a smaller island. And the devils have been stuck there for about 12,000 years since the land bridge was filled with water, the Bass Strait, between uh, southern Australia and Tasmania. And so devils have been there. And, of course, there's, they're, 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 they're quite similar genetically, very small gene pool. The most logical explanation to my mind is that, um, and this is what's generally accepted, is that a devil has developed a cancer. It's not uncommon. They're a very short-lived species too, only six, seven years. So they develop really quickly, they have a short life, and then they die really quickly. And when they do, their body goes into self-implosion. They break down phenomenally quick. So one devil's developed a cancer. Um, what's striking about it is that that devil passed it on to another devil. And the way that the disease works is that the newly infected host it can't recognize the disease because it's actually a devil facial cell. So when um, the cells passed on to, uh, you know, an infected devil passes it on to a, a, a new host, it mounts no immune response. It doesn't even know that it's got the disease. And in turn, it's nurturing it. Within three to six months, they're dead horrifically, normally from starvation and dehydration because the cancers are so gross uh, in the big lesions around their face, they can't eat or drink. Mm -hmm. So... From 1996 until today, um, about 90% of the devil population is gone from Tasmania. Mm. That's around 150,000 devils down to 10 to 15,000. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, their trajectory has stabilised a little bit in Tasmania, meaning um, you know, they're not going to go extinct in the next few years. Mm. But when your population is so heavily reduced, now you've got all the other things to consider like road strike, dog attack, um, intentional poisoning or shooting. And these things begin to have really big impacts because the population is, so you've got the disease plus the other things. So the are futures the, are- Are the devils you've been able to save, are they free of this disease? 100%. Um, okay. The devils we brought to mainland, we were able to uh, go into the wild, collect a small number of founders, quarantine them for the year. Because the disease is so aggressive, um, you can quarantine them and after 12 months, you know you've got a disease-free devil. <clears throat> but um, we've never had DFTD on the mainland, but also the disease doesn't cross between species, even closely related species to devils. Um, it's a, it's a devil specific disease because it's a devil cell. I just, I want to mention something here as well. Hmm. Um, there's a, 
the conservation system in Australia, and I, I, I say this to, to people listening, whether you're considering supporting organisations, perhaps you already do, um, perhaps there's things considered like bequests or other capacities like that, and I want to give you some friendly advice that extends well beyond Aussie Arc. Mm-hmm. Australia has found itself in a really research structured, structured conservation system. And what I mean by that is, um, I mean, research isn't necessarily conservation. Research is research. The definition of research is to watch, monitor, learn, observe. It doesn't necessarily have an outcome. And so the way that Australia is going is that, you know, we're a well-developed country. We are researching the heck out of our species yeah. to extinction. Yeah. And so we know an incredible amount about extinct species, but, and, and I don't mean this either being hugely critical to researchers. Like there are a whole bunch of good researchers, mm. but they've fallen into this niche and haven't made the real necessary noise to say, well, hold on. We're, we're, we're kind of, we're not really the custodians of conservation. Um, we're researching. And so I just would suggest to people um, and certainly use the arc as a template, whether you support us or not, doesn't matter. But we deliver outcomes and organizations like, um, uh, and I, uh, wonderful organizations, but like WWF, World Wildlife Fund, for example, they don't really deliver conservation like I do. They fundraise and then support organizations like me. But guess what? You lost 15% of your money through that process. Mm-hmm. So um, people should be very smart about backing outcome based conservation, which if you can't answer the question, okay, I see this project and I want to understand what the outcome is in five years. If you can't answer that question, mm. be a little careful. Mm-hmm. And so to the, to the point of Aussie Ark, yep. we worked with devils. We started in the Barrington Tops in uh, central eastern New South Wales. Wonderful area. It, it's from sea level to 1,400 metres above sea level in a really short area. So from like subalpine areas to subtropical rainforest, it's radical. Mm. But we ended up there because at the tops, just like Tasmania, great place for devils. Because of um, my development, I'm 39 now, and we've been doing Aussie Arc, Devil Arc since uh, 2009, 12 years. And because of my development, of our team's development, we were learning a lot of things as we go, a bunch of it, the exact things you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, But we became acutely aware of, we've got this wonderful big, where where Aussie Ark is, next door to us, we've got the wonderful World Heritage Area or National Park of Barrington Tops, 150,000 hectares, 300 odd thousand acres. And it's not in good shape. And so working with the devils and the management of a small carnivore, you know, we had the light bulb. Wow, this is really cost efficient. It's really um, a- outcome. Uh, it's achieving. It's achieving its desired outcomes, mm. and we can do this for a whole bunch of other things. Mm. Mm. So the basic model is always with the intention to keep the species in the wild long term. Yes, but that's really hard. And I, I just give you an aside on that is that. It's a funny thing, just an observation of mine, in that I travel Australia far and wide and, you know, generally speaking, native animals don't get along with agriculture. There's variations between that, right? Like if you've got, you know, outback mass cattle stations, perhaps there's natives, but when you've got paddocks cleared for ryegrass or monocropping or they really don't get along. So native wildlife and agriculture don't really get along. Then you come to um, something like our, all of our national parks. They're really underfunded and under-resourced and um, the, being able to control the feral fox and feral cat is really hard for them. Mm-hmm. So then you come to things like mines. And, um, you know, I, I, I dare not go near, um, you know, coal, burning coal is a bad thing. That's, that's not the subject I'm going down. I'm looking at it in a different way. You travel to Western Australia, let's say in the Pilbara, and... Um, I can tell where a mine is by the wildlife I can find. Now, if you go over there, the mine has about a 1.5% footprint on its entire lease. And that's legislatively what they have to do. But the mine is resourced. 
It has ecologists that it has to employ and people that have to manage the land. So ironically, <laughs> the mine sites in Australia yeah. are a better haven for wildlife than our own national parks. Oh. No, no joke. What so, an indictment. Yeah. I, I know. It's crazy, right? Mm. Um, so, and, and look, that's drawing a long bow. There are exceptions to that, of course. Mm. Um, but I, I just paint a picture that it's really hard to control the feral fox or cat. And yeah. so... Aussie Ark now um, has around 15 species recovery projects. Species recovery, a project that singularly works with a species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's realistically um, zoo, wildlife, tourism. That's our skill set, right? So you've got an endangered species. You can get us a small number of them, and we can captive breed from, let's say, 20, and yes. we can create 200. Now you're at a point of being able to harvest the interest. Mm -hmm. what do you do with them you can't just go and throw them back into the national park because guess what you're going to feed the fox or cat yeah. and there's a reason they're not in that park to start with so this is where from species recovery these singular projects we go into habitat recovery a habitat recovery could be a national park um, but we use fences and I, I really for anyone that hears that word I forgive you for having an immediate connotation of captivity. I forgive you. But I want you to look at Tasmania. Lord Howe Island. Imagine the Murray River, the Great Murray River. Around these things, you don't see fences. But I tell you, the ocean is a fence. It's a natural barrier. It stops the spread of disease, ferals, fire, weeds. We create island refuges. We just use a fence instead of the ocean, but the fence is an immediate barrier to stop the things that are the hardest to treat, the ferals. Mm. So we're, we're going from species recovery yes. with these individual singular species, and now we move into habitat recovery where we have a feral pest-free area that's managed for fire, weed, and ferals, and we reintroduce the natives. What's the scope of the land that you're managing to do that? So, so right now, um, we manage around about 3,000 hectares. This mm. isn't big, right? Because one cattle station in Western New South Wales might be a million hectares. Mm -hmm. So we manage about 3,000 um, and we acquire by the month. Yeah. So those species, do they stay with you? You know, say yep. you've got 20 quolls from somewhere. Yep. Do they stay in a, a more defined area beside quite apart from that 3,000? Yeah, so, well, let's, let's go down the path of a quoll that you mentioned. And a, a quoll for the listeners is a, a quoll is a dasyurid. A dasyurid is a carnivorous marsupial, i.e. Tasmanian tiger, Tasmanian devil. Quolls, there's four species of quoll, the eastern, the uh, chudditch, western, um, the spotted tail or tiger quoll and northern quoll. Um, these quolls, and then you've got dasyurids, carnivorous marsupials, all the way down to the size of mice and rats, really small, filled the niche in Australia. But let's go with the quoll. So eastern quolls, they were incredibly common from Brisbane to Melbourne and everywhere between until we arrived and brought the feral fox. Within 100 years, they were almost non-findable on mainland Australia. Um, by the 1950s, they were extinct. But the fox never got to Tasmania and eastern quolls are still, uh, I wouldn't say doing well, but eastern quolls are still... Uh, uh, reasonably common in, in Tasmania. So we worked with some Tasmanian partners and we got a small number of quolls from the wild. We brought them to mainland. We started with 20. We've now got about 250. Gosh. We turned that 20 through species recovery. Um, we turned that to 100. You know, So let's just say we made an investment. Um, the investment bared interest. We then harvest that interest but we don't deplete the bank, right? So we keep the species recovery ticking over, but the interest, we now return to a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Last year, we released our first Eastern quolls to, to, to one of our sanctuaries, um, about 20, 25, in fact, there's now 90. Mm -hmm. And so, so now we've gone from species recovery to habitat recovery. And of course, I'm the first person to say, I do not want the only place my kids can see native animals to be behind a fence. Hmm. That is not the plan. But at the moment, if we don't have the fence, 
We won't have natives for our kids to see. But of course, the next step is, okay, so now we've got quolls in species recovery. We've, we've taken them into habitat recovery. We've now got a population of five, 600, big numbers. And now we want to start getting them back out to where they used to be. This is really challenging. And this is beyond my remit. Now is where we need research to come in to try and figure out a way to get them back, not monitor their extinction. And now is where we need government partnerships with parks and state forests and conservation areas, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But I don't mind saying that, uh, you know, I have many, many fingers in many, many pies, but if the ark has to be an end to itself, mm. that we have these species recovery projects and, you know, in the fullness of time, we're managing 10, 20, 30, 50,000 hectares with these species. I sleep real well at night knowing that because I know if we didn't, you wouldn't have these species at all. Mm. Um, so so ideally that, it's transitionary, but if it ends up being an end in itself and we're saving these species. Oh, that's, that's right. Yep. Good job. And, and the, the thing is, I'll just give you an umbrella snapshot. So of the lands we manage, it's the same as Australia. They're overrun with ferals and the natives are barely detectable, if detectable at all. So in the Barringtons, every other, aside from the Tasmanian devil, and remember, the devil was on mainland um, some say 400 years ago. I go with the generally accepted 3,000 years ago. It's coincidental timing that the dingo came to Australia, introduced by Indigenous folk um, through Northern Australia about 5,000 years ago. A big brain placental mammal. It never got to Tasmania because the Bass Strait was there and already full with water. So, but the dingo, as the dingo moved through Australia, the devil disappears. Mm. I love dingoes. I believe they have a strong role to play in the wild. But in Eastern Australia, they're, they're, they're nearly eradicated. And so it's a complex thing, right? But with the absence of the dingo, there's no control of the fox or cat in any capacity. In come the devil. And the devil as a native solution that, and, and you know, 3,000 years ago is the ecological blink of an eye. The only things that's changed is us and their cities and roads and, you know, all this. Um, So the the thing is, aside from the devil, that is still an Australian species, not not just a Tasmanian species, but we work with, um, we've got uh, six amphibians, all endangered, critically endangered, a stuttering barred frog, giant barred frog, little John tree frog, green tree frog, green and golden bell frog, um, maybe I missed one there, uh, a, a, a giant burrowing frog. We work with three turtles. These turtles are only found in New South Wales. They're oh, only wow. found in one river system, mm. the Hunter River Turtle, the Manning River Turtle, the mm. Bells River Turtle. Um, we work with two species of quoll, the tiger quoll, spotted tail quoll, and the eastern quoll. Mm. We work with small mammals like bandicoots, bedongs, potteroos, palmer wallabies, brush tail rock wallabies, um, and, of course, Tasmanian devils. Mm. If you have a look at that suite of animals, these are all species that are in the greatest need of help in and around the Barringtons and New South Wales. Mm. So we work in their area. We facilitate species recovery in their area. We facilitate habitat recovery within their area. And then we have the ancillary partnerships that get them back into the wild. Some Mm. examples, it's a little bit easier, like the Manning River turtle or the turtles generally. Sure, they've got lots of problems, pollution, um, sediment, siltation of the rivers, water being pulled out, so severe drought and lack of water. But they've been around unchanged for about 80 million years. They're dinosaurs. They can deal with a fair bit of shit, pardon the French. (laughs) And... What they can't deal with is, again, the placental mammal. The fox is eating nearly 100% of the eggs when they're being laid on the banks and the females while they're laying them. Mm. So, there's, so, so in this case, all we have to do is cut out the fox. Mm-hmm. So with the turtles, uh, we've collected 12. We've already got now about 40 through breeding. In the coming years, we'll have 
hundreds. And each year we'll harvest hundreds and get them back into the selective parts of the rivers. Mm. So that's an easy one because we're cutting out the fox. Yeah. But you can't do that with the small mammals because if you breed lots and put them out into the paddocks, the fox eats them. Yeah. Uh, but so that's, that's essentially um, what the model is. And there's a yeah. heck of a lot of work into that. Yeah, um, I, I talk about this outcome-based conservation. And look, I, I don't mind saying um, I'm not using a university educated. I left school at 14 years old and nine months. I started my first job at a wildlife organization. I worked there for 10 years and I came to the reptile park where I've been for 16 years. I'm an on-the-tools educated person with a lot of good mentors, I might add. Um, but, you know, big brains aren't necessary to see we've got a problem and how to provide solutions. Mm. Um, and that's really, you know, my business management of, of Reptile Park and my business management of conservation is, is really, really sensible and kicking goals for us because we're just fundamentally fixated on an outcome, and that is yeah. to improve the trajectory of an endangered species. Yeah. This is a good thing. Absolutely. You go back to the 1970s and 80s, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners here will, will remember this, you know, there were people out there just saving forests because we were losing them. And those people, you know, heroes in that period, they, they, they've left the legacy of our national parks. Mm-hmm. And, and, and thank you, you know, like, mm. but what happened is, and they, they did nothing wrong, but the legacy that they wanted to leave was these wild places that remain wild. But it, it came with like a set and forget mentality. You know, mm. we got it, put it there, it's protected forever. And unfortunately, that set and forget mentality doesn't work if you want animals in your parks. Mm-hmm. It needs management. And so I really see myself as a custodian of continuing that legacy of those heroes um, that we have not just the park protected, but it's animals. Um, and, you know, we're winning, but we're not winning as quick as things are getting bad. Yeah, right. Do you do you tag the species when you release them so that you know what's happening? Yeah, what, e- you know. E- even within the sanctuaries. And there's a balance in this because I'd ask you to think of a devil, Tasmanian devil for a moment. One of the things you might notice very quickly is that it has no neck. And it does have a neck, of course, but marsupials have these weird shoulders and, 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 and very prominent front quarters. Mm. So it's like um, if I assimilated it to a dog, you know, like a, a staffy, Staffordshire terrier, their neck comes right into the – so the collar falls off. So with a lot of the marsupials, sure, you can neck collar some of them, um, but you can. We, we tend to use tail transmitters. So – Everything is microchipped and identified. Um, But when we release, we'll generally do a tester. You know, we'll put three or six of a species out there and just see how they go. And we'll radio collar them for a period of time. But when we do a release of 20 or 60 or 100 of an individual species, we still then only radio track a small portion of them because the, the radio tracking device it's heavy, it's cumbersome, it rubs, it can cause infection, it can fall off. They can get their claws caught in it. They can get it caught in a tree. Mm. So <clears throat> they're very useful, but they also have their challenges. So once we've sort of tested the water, um, and, you know, there are expected mortalities with any release. It's no different than this. For example, saltwater crocodiles lay a lot of eggs. They have a lot of hatchlings every year, but less than one in a thousand make it um, past 10 years of life. So, yeah, Tasmanian devil joeys, females have four joeys. Those four don't survive in the wild in Tasmania. Um, You know, if one or two get... And so what happens is, like um, young marsupials naturally dispersing from their parents with a high mortality, when you release animals, you're going to have a mortality rate. Um, But realistically, that needs to be measured that it's not higher than 30%. And there are, of course, benchmarks in to be able to assess a successful release. But yes, um, we don't just dump them and say, you know, all the very best. And of course, we've got the management of there's no ferals, fires managed, feral weeds are managed, um, and we can have some controlled level of intervention. Mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere that um, the Tasmanian devil was released into one of the local national parks. Did that happen in the last couple of years? No, well, well, well that was us. And uh, and yes, and look, it's so political um, and, and understandably, I mean, Tasmania has got a, a bit of a parochial attitude around our devil. 
Um, and the thing is, the, the devil on mainland Australia was here not so long back. And it, 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 it presents one of the only natural control measures of the fox and cat. Where you have devils, you have less cats. Where you have devils, they change the behaviour of foxes. And so at the moment, we've released devils into our sanctuaries. They're fenced, right? But they're big. Mm-hmm. The devils aren't fed. They're not watered. They're not cared for. They don't get vet treatment. They're on their own. They're the definition of wild. Mm-hmm. We're, we're ramping up to a trial release in a national park outside a fenced area, um, and that will happen in years to come. And, again, the ambition of that is that if we can have a natural control, <clears throat> control measure of fox and cat, um, wowee. And when you look at Tasmania and the rest of Australian states and territories, guess which state or territory in Australia has the lowest extinction rate? Tasmania. Mm-hmm. We want some of that. Yeah, and, uh, and so that's why the ambition to return devils to mainland Australia. It's also a unique case because imagine if I was saying we're trying to release tigers or, um, you know, large cats or wolves. Or, but the devil doesn't eat small children or people <laughs> and it doesn't eat cattle. Mm-hmm. It's, too, it's too small. So it prevents it presents a really unique opportunity where it can be a natural control measure to Australian ecological systems. It gets along with people and agriculture, and that makes it very unique in that mould. So, yes, we have, and I, I should mention that right now, devils always breed in February, March. They only have a 21-day pregnancy. They give birth in um, late March, April. So snapshot now to August, and we've got devil joeys that are about the size of Uh, a pear cut in half and um, that's very exciting so come October we do our trapping and we get to see who's got what and and what's about and that's just just a wonderful time. Mm, mm. This might be too much detail but is there any issue in introducing a top line predator like the spotted quoll which I know can take down you know animals at same size I think. Uh, Yeah is there any danger in introducing a predator like that and the impact that that has, does, does somehow, does sometimes yeah, uh, the reverse outcome take place? Uh, uh, absolutely. And look, I, I've got a little saying behind me here on my wall um, that, that, that I really like, which is, if all possible objections must firstly be overcome, nothing will ever be attempted. We're suffering that in Australia in a very big way. So to answer your question, it's, it's very balanced. And I'll ask you this question. The spot tail quoll that's being released or reintroduced, did it used to occur there? Yes. Let's yes. say yes. Mm. If you've created an artificial scenario, mm. um, perhaps a fenced area that's too small, or you fenced in an area that had the world's only population of a critically endangered species, you wouldn't do that. But the quoll is a natural part of the ecology. It's been there. It was there 50 years ago. Not a lot has changed. So I give you an example. Recently, there was some news around the devils that were released to Mariah Island in Tasmania. They decimated like two or three thousand penguins. Devils were never found on Mariah Island. Uh-huh. There's a reason the penguins nested there. When you put de- and this was all considered early in the piece, but. Um, so that was reintrod- that was introducing a species that to an area it had never been. And guess what? It had an impact. Mm. But reintroducing the quoll, certainly, if it's on a level playing field and you haven't got one, you know, endemic, critically endemic, the quoll just slots in nicely. And in fact, to the predators at this juncture, because of the rabbit and hare that are easy prey, because of the abundance of native herbivores that are too big for the fox and cat to eat, i.e., Wombats, big wallabies, wallaroos, kangaroos. There's a hell of a lot of prey out there that no one's eating because we've lost the top order predators. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, realistically, that's the question. If you're slotting them back into an area, and, and most of the areas that we're working in, things like quolls are actually were still present, but almost undetectable. 
you know, just in such low numbers that, you know, that they're, they're just about to extinguish. Mm. Um, so yeah, good, good question, but, um, but reasonably easy to overcome if you've mm. got the right habitat and platform. Yeah. Well, this is where research and outcome-based projects like yours fit hand in glove, don't they? That's, that's right. And, and look, I, I, I don't say this in any um, arrogant or egotistical way, but um, there's a real scope for research to follow conservation. And that, 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 like I said, somehow it's kind of been branded that like research is conservation, but it's not. Mm. It's not unless it's delivering conservation. <laughs> um, and so in that regard, this is what, what we need is we're experts in um, species and habitat recovery. But there's only so many of us and we've only got so big a reach. What we need is the research to fill in the gaps at the other end. Mm. Um, why a translocation was successful or wasn't successful. Um, what interactions are happening. And so you can really start to answer some questions that are all dealing with the bigger picture of uh, delivering actual tangible conservation. Mm. Well, Tim, you've educated me today. Like there's so many things you've said that are, are new to me and uh, opened my eyes um, in a way that they absolutely needed to be opened. And uh, I think some of your points about us knowing more about pandas and, you know, yeah. some some rare elephant or, you know, the, the whales, our knowledge and uh, of that is, uh, is way in excess of our knowledge of yeah. what's happening in Australia. And to, and to think that we've lost, I think you said, 40 species in the last 200 years. That's, that's only the mammals. Yeah, okay. Only the mammals and yeah. the trajectory with the koalas and, yeah. Yeah, it's not good. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you. And if I'm sure there's people who'd be interested to support the project in some way or to get involved, what avenues do people have for that? Yeah, look, we're, we're a, a registered not-for-profit organisation, very easy to find as Aussie Ark. Um, it's AussieArc.org, um, very simple, social and all that business. But our website's very easy to find us. Um, I, I, I commend anyone to support us. Um, we, we rely upon uh, philanthropic, corporate and many, many, many individual um, donations, bequests and the like. And so in that regard, um, I'm sure you can probably take from me that I'm not a pretty face trying to sell you something. I'm on the tools. <laughs> this is what I do. Um, yeah. I would also say beyond Aussie Arc, there are good organisations like Australian Wildlife Conservancy, Bush Heritage mm. um, and a bunch of other smaller organisations. I would just again applaud you to just try and establish that what you're supporting is actually having a tangible outcome. If, if, if you did nothing more than that and supported whoever you like, it would make my day. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Tim. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. No, thanks, mate. All, all, all the very best. Mm -hmm.